All right, back again. We're getting ready to wrap this up now. The basic picture here that you're seeing as both the trend of history and the tribulation in particular is that politics and religion make common bedfellows, but they don't really like each other. Okay? One of the things that's always been true in history, no matter where you look, is that you have all these religious types of whatever their religion is, okay, whether it was in Egypt or SPQR or any other polity. Russia is a really good example of this. Where the people who run the religion, once they have some sense of their size, want to start to dictate to the government principles that they think are proper because of their religious views. The government, by contrast, recognizes that bid for power for what it is. And typically speaking, a king or, you know, elected representatives or whatever are going to be sort of constrained to give credence or hearing to what the religious types say but they will actually seek to use whatever they do in order to keep the religious folks at bay. That's what Constantine did. Again, this is all about Constantine. Constantine is depicted in, in Matthew 24 as I'm going to get more into. I've covered this before but i got to cover it again. Constantine is depicted in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13 as the starter, as the poster boy. And when John writes this, he's playing to those passages because a reader would be very familiar with it by then. First of all, you got history telling you the same story. And now you've got, ever since Moses really, the Bible telling you the same story about you're believing in me, the real God. You know, the real God, when he took Israel out of Egypt, there was no king. You were supposed to obey God. And if you obeyed God, you wouldn't need a king. You wouldn't need politics. It was between God and you. And yeah, you had a priesthood because that was the way to learn Bible doctrine. Okay? And there was the Sanhedrin, which, you know, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, suggested to Moses to do because in the very beginning Moses was just trying to hear all the disputes between people as a civil matter all right and it was too much for him so the whole idea of civil government is sort of like well it's a necessary thing we got to have but God was basically saying from the very beginning to Israel and of course now to us hi if you're if I'm your king you don't need another king. But the other nations, they didn't really agree with that. They wanted the, the king to rule over the religion. And that's what the king wanted to do over the religion because he wanted to keep the religion at bay because, okay, the pol pol politicians hate the religious types and the religious types hate the politicians. It's Hatfields and McCoys. And that's how it always was. So what basically happened in the in the ancient world, and to a considerable extent in the Roman Empire, and especially in Byzantine, is that the kings looked at the religious types and said, okay, we're going to accommodate you. But we have final say as to what powers you have and what kind of things you can teach. Now in Rome, you know, original Rome, that worked because the accommodation was that whatever religion you wanted to believe in was fine. Freedom of religion. So long as the religious practice that you come up with doesn't go against the state. Doesn't preach sedition. Okay, but that's what Christians were doing in the first and second century. After Christ died. They started getting into, oh, I'm Christian, I'm better than you, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of them were using it as an excuse not to do their civic duty. 
oh, I can't belong into the army. I need to leave the army because I'm Christian now. Christ never said that. God never said that. Paul explained against it. In 1 Timothy 2, um, I want to say Galatians 3, um, 1 Corinthians 15, which was in the context of after death, and especially Romans 13 through 15. You are to obey elected or con duly constituted authority. But these Christians didn't want to do that. Well, that's why they, Christian and sedition became, you know, synonymous terms in the Roman mind. All right? Jew and sedition became synonymous terms in the Roman mind. It, it shouldn't have been that way. God didn't create it that way. That's not what happened when God brought them out of Israel. All right? And so, because they didn't listen, he, you know, Saul ended up becoming an earthly king over them because that's what they wanted. They wanted politics. And it went downhill from there with David being the good king because if you can't have the good, if the people won't be good, then you need the king to be good. And most of the kings weren't good. A few of them were. It's really amazing just how bad those kings were for the most part. So, the, part, the kings hate the religion, and the religion hates the kings. Alright? So as a result of that, and here's the point. All the time that they're using religion in order to get their power, they're hating it. Sooner or later, there's going to develop, and you're going to see this in the Trump administration. It's already started in the first two months of his office. Is that there's going to be schism. There's going to be the equivalent of, you know, the internal civil war. As a result of that civil war, there's going to actually be somebody setting off nuclear bomb. And the harlot, okay, is going to get burned as a result. So eventually the, the po political groups that back this religion are going to actually go to war with the religion during the very last period as well as going to war with each other in Har Megiddo in the Valley of Australia and you know people say well you know how can you have you know all the armies of the world meet there it's not really that big well it's not the only place that the war is going on it's just this, the place that um Christ is going to come back to and it's, this is Jerusalem centric and so it's talking about that particular battle there but there's going to be civil war and you know Christian against non-Christian and all this other kind of war everybody with each other all over the world in particular though the harlot has a particular location sort of headquarters and there's some kind of nuclear bomb that's going to go off now, there's another passage, and I can't remember where it is, that says the smoke of her burning will go up forever. Okay? You've heard that, so you can Google on it. I'm not going to search it right now, because I've got too much to cover here. So, like, where is that? Because the question is, who is the harlot? What's the location of the harlot? And, of course, right here it says a woman, harlot, is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now it's talking about everybody all over the place. Alright, the word earth when you see it in English in these Bibles, it's either talking specifically about Israel, but it's mistranslated earth, or it's talking about the whole world. Gay means, you know, the, the ground. Okay. Cosmos means the inhabited earth. Alright, so what great city? Now, you know, there have been a lot of speculation. My pastor fell prey to this too. Is the great city, because see, it says fallen is Babylon the great. And elsewhere you'll you'll find it talking about, well, ba Babylon 
is the spiritual designation for Jerusalem being evil. Okay, well, I mean, that that's a, an application, too. But Jerusalem has never reigned over all the kings of the earth. And it's never depicted as ever having that status. Not till Christ comes back. That's when it has that status. The pact that's made between the Jewish Antichrist and the Gentile Antichrist in Daniel 11 the Jewish Antichrist is very much subordinate. So great city isn't strictly and only speaking about Jerusalem and it cannot be speaking about Jerusalem as a physical location that gets burnt with fire because that's where Christ comes back and where he rules. You know that he doesn't. When he, the minute he comes back, the millennium occurs on the same earth. There's not a new heavens and new earth until after that 1050 ends. So, what's the great city that reigns over all the kings of the earth? Well, this I submit to you is also metaphorical. There will be an actual physical location, a headquarters for this world religion, and a headquarters for this federation. But it can be anywhere in the world. That particular location then, during the tribulation, will probably be the place that gets the nuclear weapon. And is it going to be burnt up forever with the smoke going up forever? Well, maybe. I don't know if the smoke is literal or it's metaphorical of the memory. Okay, because then it goes into this whole, Revelation 18 is this long, long passage of you know the pride of the city okay and all the people that sold everything from her and all they smoke see they they saw the smoke of her burning well what city is like the great city well they can't be talking about Jerusalem some say well the great city is actually Rome well you don't really know that either I submit to you that it's like the actual headquarters of wherever this is going to be and the second thing I submit to you is that it's more the idea. There's always a headquarters of any nation, of any place. You have your one great city or your two great cities inside a, a, a nation. Okay. But more importantly, because it's talking about reigns over the kings of the earth, it's the idea. And, and, and what idea was it? Well, like Rome. I mean, that was pretty much what it did. It called itself Senatus Populusque Romanus. The Senate and the people of Rome. Rome was just a part of the empire. But it was like personified and deified and all this other good stuff. The great city of Rome. Rome this, Rome that. The culture of Rome. Well, you could be in Bithynia, which is north northwestern Anatolia and you call yourself a Roman and there were all kinds of little cities it was kind of like what Alexander did so many centuries prior is is like oh okay well Rome is an idea and we'll just build every single city that we come to and we'll call it Roman like Constantine makes a second Rome replete with seven mountains so it isn't one particular city, it's the idea of a great city. You see? Because in order to reign over the kings of the earth, it can't be one city. Because this is talking about like all, this is like history. All these people. All the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn. Because nobody buys their cargo. And these kinds of things in the cargo, all right, a lot of these things are not popular anymore. Okay, they stand for valuable goods. They were valuable goods at the time, in order for the reader at the time to get a sense of, you know, commerce. But today, nobody even cares about frankincense, except maybe a few churches. Wait a minute. <coughs> Sorry. Okay? 
Oh, well, it's not expensive anymore. Fine flour, not expensive anymore. Wheat, oh, it's dirt cheap. Cattle's still expensive, but frankly, not that much. Prices on, on meat are double over the last nine years what they were, but what they were was about the same as I remember from 40 years ago. Okay. Cargoes of horses. Chariots. Nobody wants to use chariots and slaves. Okay? A lot of these things that are listed are not literal. They're metaphorical for values that applied at the time. You always interpret the Bible at the time that it's written. But that doesn't mean that what it meant at the time it was written is literally what, how you're supposed to interpret it today. Okay? So, what does the great city mean? The concept. And yeah, there's going to be some physical city that represents that concept. You know, like everybody says, Washington, D.C., or Paris, or Rome, or, let's see, what are some of the supposedly great, uh, Moscow. You know, a lot of times our, our countries pride themselves on one or two of our great cities. But it's really the idea of the city. I'm, you know, I'm Russian and it's Moscow. Okay, but you might be in Vladivostok. So you're not actually in Moscow. But it's like, it's like the embodiment, the emblem for your whole sense of nationhood. Alright? So it's an idea and the idea reigns over the kings of the earth. You can see that. All right, and so that's like a, that's like being in love with a woman. I mean, I'm assuming that I'm I've never I'm I'm not gay, and I don't really understand what why a man would act the way he does. I don't particularly understand men. Don't say I understand women either, but the idea is that being attracted to the gold and glitter and appearance and you know, all that. It reigns over you. Whatever you're attracted to reigns over you. Alright? That's the scary thing about our time right now is that everybody's, you know, all these Christians, Seven Mountains, and so many others in the whole GOP are attracted to Trump. What is attractive about Trump? I can't even look at him. His eyes are absolutely wacko. If you look at his eyes, it's like, there's something really wrong with this man. You hear his voice? Two and a half seconds after hearing his voice, I can't take it anymore. It's just, it's just pure drivel and pure evil. I don't see anything at all attractive about him. He's the ugliest person I've ever heard. And I used to think some others were bad. Alright? And maybe you pick somebody else. But see, the, the woman reigning over the kings of the earth means that they're, they're attracted. But they're, and it's a city. The idea of a city. Something that you're attracted to. It's politically attractive. It's emotionally attractive. It's religiously attractive. And you give everything to it. So is that not reigning over you? I mean, I can get pretty religious about cilantro and peanut butter and chicken liver. And to a certain extent, those things actually reign over me. Because I don't want to live without them. Milk especially. If I can't have milk, just put me in the coffin right now. For you, maybe it's chocolate cream pie. Alright? Whatever you're really attracted to so much that you're going to rule your life around it or regulate your life around it so that you can have it, that's reigning over you. Reigning, not ruling. See, because it's not making any rules for your life. It's not telling you how to live. It's being what it is so noble and attractive to you that you regulate yourself to it. Okay, but see, we're supposed to be thinking that way about God. Not a city. And obviously that's why this description is so long. It's all these people, oh, whoa, great city. For in one hour your judgment has come. And we weep and mourn because we can't buy their cargoes anymore. 
Oh, we used to have so much fun in that city and we can't go there anymore. Look at all of our goods that we sold there. They all get nostalgic. You know how people get. Oh, the glories of Rome in the past. Oh, the glories of Paris in the past. Oh, the glories of, of Italy in the past. Oh, the glories of Russia in the past. Or whatever country they're from. They always want to go back to the past. That's what this is all about. Luxury and splendid. And that's what the apostles were doing. They weren't, strictly speaking, apostles at that point. They were just students. But that's what they're doing in Matthew 24. The very the chapter starts with the, the, the chief guys, as you find out from Mark. Peter. And James. And John. And Andrew, the top guys, amongst the, the twelve. And they're going, oh, these beautiful buildings looking at the temple. See, they're doing the same thing as being depicted here. Oh, the beautiful buildings. Oh, the temple. And Jews talk the same way. Oh, the temple this, the temple that, the temple the other thing. And they wouldn't know the first thing about the temple if it bit them. Oh, we're going to stand in front of the wailing wall and bob, 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 wearing our pay ass. And what's that? Have you ever actually looked at the Kotel? That's what they call the wailing wall. It's the area around the wailing wall. People take little prayers. And they write them on little slips of paper and they stick them in the cracks. As if somehow the wall is going to grant their prayer. They stand and they bob in front of that wailing wall as if they were holy to do so. First of all, the wailing wall isn't even necessarily the remainder of the temple. Secondly, bobbing in front of a building of stones instead of talking to the real God just direct and learning his word correctly uh, then you're praying as it were to an idol that's what this is they're idolizing this whole thing about city the great city it's some place that they idolize this world the politics the, the glamour you know like New York New York and it's like please Okay? And people do that all the time. They ooh and ah over the buildings of Greece and ancient Rome. And, and when you, they go to discuss some achievement of some ancient king, it's like, and he built this, and he built that, and he built this other building. Blah, 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 blah. That's just like the apostles saying to Christ, Oh, these beautiful stones. And he says, just like here, great city. There's not going to be one stone on top of another. So you see, John is pulling his material from Matthew 24, which is echoed in and elaborated on in Ephesians 1, Luke 21 for the West, and Mark 13, which we're going to get to for the East. So you see, this is where John's getting his stuff. Now, it's, it's real history. It's real, I mean, real future it's literally going to be true. But see, John is carrying forward. This is what Bible books are supposed to do. You carry forward the threads from the prior Bible books to prove that your book is actually from God. And what John's task is in Revelation is to pull all the threads into one book to close the book. Which he does do. So if anybody's telling you that there's any sort of, ins you know, um, Revelation after Revelation, you can tell them to just go stuff it. And here's how you know. These words are faithful and true. Behold, and this isn't quickly, this is next. Greek word is taku. See right here. Okay, it means suddenly. It's a like surprise attack. Not quickly like in two minutes from now. Very bad translation. Okay, it, mean, it, it means swift. Okay, in other words, let's see. 
instead, okay, you suddenly appear from nowhere. And not only do you suddenly appear from nowhere, but your appearance from the time you're seen to the time you get to the, the door is so fast it's like, you know, beam me up Scotty. All right? It's, it's a military tactic. And I don't remember if it's there. Talks about it. Let's see. See, focus on speed of the activity. So it should be translated suddenly. Okay? It relatively brief on some went to another. Yeah, but that's not really correct. He's deferring to the translators who translated it wrong. Okay. Who is better one to translate it? Swift. Okay. In other words, from point A to point B might be thousands of years, but when it happens, it's immediate. It's like the imminency of the rapture is likened to an earthquake. Okay. California is sitting on San Andreas Fault. Any day, the, f the big one, as we call it in California, the, and any day the big one can happen, which is supposed to be so bad that it's going to split California off from the coast of the U.S. And it'll happen when it happens. If it happens, it'll be... But it could be 10 years from now, tomorrow, 1,000 years from now. Next, like the sword of Damocles hanging over your head. If it's hanging over your head and you happen to fall asleep, and it, it can come down in a nanosecond. But it's not doing anything now. So the point between A and B could be of long duration, but when it happens, it's fast. Boom. All right, that's what this is saying. I'm coming swiftly. When I come, whenever that is, today, tomorrow, a thousand years from now, the, my coming itself is a swift motion. Now look, blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. In other words, if you learn this, it's real important to learn it. It makes a huge difference in your life. That's the blessing. Blessing, the word that's translated blessing really means happiness. I don't know if they're going to have it here, but happy. It, the stress when it says blessed it's a happiness that's so big God must have done it to you you couldn't have created that happiness yourself and man couldn't have given it to you okay so happy God God given happiness to get the words of this prophecy of this book that's why I'm talking about it. It makes a huge difference when you finally understand Revelation. So few do. So few try. Okay? So now this is his closing. This is, w this is where an epilogue begins. He's closing the book. I, John. See, that's closing like a closing of the letter. Sincerely yours, John. I, I'm testifying that I heard and saw. And then he's getting it to the epilogue phase. And the angel says, don't worship me. I'm a servant too. See, when you love God, you don't want anybody complimenting you. And it's not like you're trying to be humble. It's because you got better things to think about and you think everybody else has better things to think about, too. Okay, I mean, I feel really sorry for your big A-list movie stars. Because they feel, they get that drooling over them all the time. And they, 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 they just want to be a human being like you. Yeah, they make a lot of money and they have to be good at what they do. But they don't think of themselves as, oh, I'm this really important person. Only Donald Trumps of the world think like that. If you really are, have achieved something, you're actually amazed by it and a little humiliated. And you don't want somebody treating you as big and important because of it. If anything, it becomes a noose around your neck, an albatross. It's like, please, just, just, yes, my name is Anthony Hopkins, but don't, don't, 
just just call me Tony. Okay, can I relate to you as one human being to another human being? Or, or is this act or fact going to be sticking in the face between me and you all the time like a big scarlet letter? That's the whole problem with this. All right, so the angel who is light years better in every respect than John. John fell, falls down to prostrate. It really means to prostrate himself before. And he said, don't do that. Stop it. It's actually very um, strong. See? Stop it. Okay, don't. Just, just, now stop. See? This, this is just, just stop. See that you stop. Just stop it. Really, it's a better way to translate it. Not do not do that. We don't talk like that in English, and he's not talking about that here. Stop it. It's an idiom. He's, he's really kind of pissed, actually. Isn't that imperative? Yep. He's like, see to it that you don't do this. No! Just stop! Alright? I'm a slave, too. Don't, don't, yes, I'm an angel, yes, I'm higher, yes, I'm smarter, and all the other stuff, but I'm not counting it, so you shouldn't either. Doesn't matter to me. I'm too busy looking at God to care about the fact that I might be of higher status than you. That's how we're all going to be thinking in heaven. Because that's how this one's thinking here. Alright? And, and your brethren, the prophets, see? The prophets of higher status. Oh, the prophet Isaiah is better and blah, blah, blah. Honey, you're a prophet too. Prophet means to foretell. For, to foretell. Can you talk about scripture? To the extent you can talk about it competently, you're a prophet. It's not like the old days. And those who heed the words of God. Worship God, not me. And the more mature you become in life, the more you're going to feel that way. It, it, it actually becomes very uncomfortable when people compliment you. And it's not like you're trying to be humble. You just don't like it. I don't like lemon meringue pie. I don't like people giving me compliments. I like to give compliments, so I'm, you know, dual standard hypocrite. But I don't like getting them. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. What does that mean? That means don't hide it. Alright? Let the one that is wrong, in other words, don't, don't hide it, disclose it, and let history keep on going. Alright? And now all of a sudden, and in Greek drama this is called interjection, Christ suddenly, it's no longer the angel, Christ suddenly interjects. It's called an interjection. It's where uh, the actor suddenly comes like on stage and he, he looks at the audience. Okay, and, and in this particular case, John is playing the audience of church. I'm coming suddenly, not quickly. My reward is with me. In other words, I'm going to be the one giving to you. That's Isaiah 53, 12. Shalal in Hebrew. He will give, the, he will share out the booty to every man according to what he has done. Now, what have you done? This is what kills me about Christianity. You're so screwed up about this. What have you done? Anything that you do. Seriously. You turn on the shower faucet. What did you do? You turn the handle of something somebody else made. Where did you get the ability to turn the handle? It's in your hand. Where did you get your hand? It has to work. Or you can't turn that handle. So what did you do? Your hand did something because your hand is in good health. You can turn the handle because somebody made the handle. And behind that handle is a whole bunch of pipes and a whole bunch of other stuff that a whole bunch of other people made with their hands. So what would you do? 
So everybody who's sitting there trying to claim, well, I did this and I did that and I achieved this and I achieved that, 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 they're all liars. Because there's nothing you can do of yourself. Everything you do is a product of something else that went before, came before, or biology that you didn't cause. And you can exercise till you're blue in the face, and that exercise won't work if your genetics don't fit it. As any free woman over menopause can tell you. When the body doesn't want to get in shape, ain't going to get in shape no matter how many grapefruit diets you want, and no matter how many step stairs you do. Okay? And I wish that weren't true. I'm going through it now. Ha ha. So now, see, here's how we know it's Christ. I am the first and the last. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet, last letter of the Greek alphabet. So he says, first and last, beginning and the end. Now, this is what begins a, a, a sort of like, John is saying, you know, I, John, saw these things. This is his testimony. He's closing the book. Now we're getting into sort of an epilogue. The angel giving his final testimony, who's been talking to John all this time, and then Christ himself. All right? Blessed are those who wash their robes. That means believe in Christ. Okay? So you may have a right to the tree of life. You know, it's a, a that I, I'm not even going to get into that right now. That's a whole other metaphor. May enter the gates into the city. See, we had a bad city, and now we got a good city. And the good city is the new Jerusalem on, on coming down from the sky. And another Jerusalem, which is already on the ground. So that's why we know that whatever gets blown up by a nuclear bomb is not physically Jerusalem. Because that's where Christ comes back. Okay? Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and immoral persons. Okay, that's outside heaven. It's also outside the city that during the millennium. You have to have special privileges to be able to even get in. And that's why, you know, it's going to be real important that we come back with him because we're going to be ruling all the countries, okay, in order for Israel to have peace from her enemies. And you can't get into Jerusalem to see the glorious Christ and ooh and ah over those buildings unless you are a believer okay so all the things that people drool over now are going to be provided then only they'll be real then and not just something that you ooh and ah over instead of him because it will be him I Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches okay and this is like, you know, his seal. See, he's sealing. He's doing the sealing. Don't seal up, he says to John, don't seal up the words. In other words, communicate them. But Jesus is the one who's testifying it. He's the root and he's the seal. Remember? He has the seven seals. They get open. He's the key. He has the keys. That's in Revelation 1. So now it's closing. Spirit and bride say, come. I'm not sure I'll what to say about that. It's, it's a, some kind of antiphonal thing, but I haven't figured out all the rest of it. He was thirsty. Remember waters? Thirsty for the water of the word. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life, water of the word, without cost. This is a reference to Isaiah 53. Okay? And now he's closing the book. I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. Now watch. This is how you know it's closed. Right here. If anyone adds See, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. It's now the closing book of Revelation. It isn't just the Revelation book. It's the closing book of Scripture. If anyone adds to them. So there's no ex cathedra. Okay, verboten. God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book, the Bible. And if anyone takes away 
from the words of this book of this prophecy see because the whole Bible prophecy means to to foretell to tell the truth as well as foretell tell the future if anyone takes away then God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city that's the New Jerusalem which are written in this book now tree of life you will remember that was in the garden pre-fall and that they ate special fruit that basically kept them going you could just they had all the nutrition or whatever it was that they needed for their bodies okay but metaphorically it ends up meaning a sort of inheritance in the eternal state doesn't mean you're not saved it means there's an inheritance see because look Adam and the woman were alive they were in the garden this was in addition to them being in the garden it was necessary for their life but it was in addition okay so the tree of life comes to mean something that you have that you enjoy on a daily basis so it comes to mean blessing so yeah you're going to be saved but it's like first corinthians 13 Oh, yeah, well, I'm saved as though through fire. In other words, all my works I spent my time doing, thinking that was godly. Well, they all get burnt up and I got nothing to show for it. Why? Because I didn't learn and live on Bible. Bible is gold, silver, precious stones. You can go look that up. It's the water of life. It's your clothing. It's your everything. And on top of that, you'll have all these privileges that you get to use your Bible on in the eternal state that's the wealth you take with you in your head in your soul and if you don't do that and you won't do that if you're taking words away from the book then God will take your this, this isn't part it's portion it's like inheritance see meros it's a technical word really right here this is used in Isaiah 53.12. And Paul uses it again, um, Metron Meros in um, Ephesians 4.16. And uh, again in Romans 12, somewhere in verses 1 through 3. It means your share. In other words, here's a pie. It's divided into 12 pieces and you get one twelfth. That's what Meros means. All right. So it's not his part, it's his portion, it's his inheritance. You're, you got two siblings and your rich uncle dies and you get two thirds of the estate and they each get, you know, half of a third. Okay, so your part of the estate is two thirds and their part in the estate is half of one third each. That's share. So they should say his share from the tree of life. Because the tree of life will be in the New Jerusalem, where everybody gets to, you know, play. All right. So here's the upshot. This is what the warning is. Here's a book. It's being closed. You're hearing the words. Prophecy has those two meanings: foretelling and foretelling. If anybody adds to them, like right now, I've been spending all this time saying things, making claims about the meaning of the words and I'm showing you the words while I do that because you know what what if I'm screwing it up what if I'm telling you something incorrectly or wrong or lying to you well by showing you the words then God will alert you to what I'm saying wrong and if I'm guilty then I get punished I mean it isn't necessarily plague like bubonic plague but I'll be punished Similarly, if I'm taking away words from the book, it means it's just subtracting meaning out of it. See, like, the Pope thing is really bad because it's adding doctrines that don't exist in the Bible in order to obfuscate God. Okay? But it's just as wrong to take away the prophecy about the Jews having a millennium as Israel's queen of the nations. All right. In order to say, well, see, church and uh, church started in Abraham's tent. That's what preterists seem to think. 
Well, you're taking away books of, specifically, you're taking away words from Revelation. Because Revelation 7 names the Jews by tribe, honey. 144,000 evangelists who are going to be his honorage at, at least for the thousand years, if not eternity. They're named by number and by tribe, Jewish tribe. Origen took away words out of Revelation 7 and said, well, those, those, those 144,000 are Christians and the Jehovah Witnesses are taking away words from that chapter saying well they're special believers honey you have to be you have to be a Trump voter to read Revelation 7 that badly Trump voters that it's like there's no words that they hear rightly they just make up anything that they wanted to say so they're taking away from the words that really are there go look up Revelation 7 and then ask yourself how is this not literal both Origen and the Jehovah Witness people, they're absolutely nuts. So they're taking away words from the book. God will take away your share, your inheritance, your shalal is how it's the word that's used in Hebrew of Isaiah 53, 12 for the marrows. From the tree of life. Tree of life has to do with your enjoyment of eternity. Enjoyment of perfect environment. And then Holy City, of course, is the New Jerusalem. It's a physical location. It's going to be a glory to see it. And all this drooling over the buildings and the commerce and all these things that was going on in, in, in Revelation 18. Oh, come out of her. Yeah, that's what we need to do. But one day her plagues come, her pestilence and all this horrible stuff. And everybody's going to cry. Oh, the pretty city's gone. We can't we can't enjoy our life in her anymore. Well, there's a counter city being started. You want to be in it? See? Holy city. That means Jerusalem. That's what it's always called. Okay? So, I skipped over to 22 so I could show you the outcome of 17. The basic idea behind 17 is beginning with Constantine there was a unity of church and state. That is a trend that continues even to this day and it is especially disturbing right now because the king of the north, Russia, and the king of the north predicted as the Gentile Antichrist, which is successively west, are romancing. And there's no, there's no way to know that they're saved. So Satan's trying to get the rapture to happen by making sure it's so apostate that God has to recall us, as it were, and therefore the judgment and the nasty things can begin, which Satan wants very much because he's trying to destroy the Jews. And if he can destroy the Jews or destroy the Christians before the rapture happens, he wins. Hopefully that helps. If not, let me know.